All right, thanks, Natasha. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Greg Trudell. I'm the medical director of the Barton Sleep Lab. Uh, I see patients in Truckee. Um, great turnout, so thanks everybody for showing up, even if it's virtual. We got almost 50, just hit 50 participants, so that's awesome. So if you saw the flyer, this is the information that we shared. Um, gonna talk about sleep hygiene, which is a big emphasis really with most sleep complaints and you know how to get a better night's sleep. Uh, we'll talk a little about what sleep is, why it's important, and then uh, also cover you know two of the more common things that, that I see in my practice, which is uh, insomnia and sleep apnea. Oop, I get this button thing down here, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is a quote, sleep is an absurdity, a bad habit. And this was actually from a very famous uh, inventor, Thomas Edison, and he invented the light bulb and the Edison bulb, which we all often enjoy now in our houses. Um, he was a brilliant man. Uh, and like many brilliant men, he didn't sleep much. He thought it just kind of got in the way of progress. But despite his brilliance, he was dead wrong about sleeping absurdity and a bad habit. So first off, I'd just like to cover normal sleep, um, normal stages of sleep. Let's see if my pointer works here. So most of us, we go to bed and typically 20, 30 minutes at the most to fall asleep. And then we quickly get into deeper and deeper late stages of sleep from one to four. Uh, then we bounce into a period of REM and REM happens throughout the night in about 90 minute intervals. Although you'll see towards the latter half of the night, uh, it's much more concentrated. And so this is normal sleep. It'll vary a great deal uh, person to person and night to night. Uh, but you'll see REM occurs right before you wake up. You know, if you're sleeping the recommended eight hours. Uh, and this is uh, something you'll probably notice. Like, wow, I just had this crazy dream right before I woke up. Well, REM sleep is the stage of sleep where we tend to have those very vivid, wild, memorable dreams. And then, of course, it happens right before we wake up. And uh, oftentimes we'll remember, you know, specific details of that. If you are into EEGs, if you look at the EEG, the brainwave pattern of wake and REM sleep, they're actually very similar. And there's a lot of theories on why that happens and why it's important. And we're not going to cover that tonight. But this is kind of just an overview of the stages of normal sleep. Next big question, how much sleep do we need? Well, um, if you're a puppy, you need about 14 hours a night. If you're a kitten, about 16 hours a night. Um, interestingly, puppies, I don't know about kittens, like they're, I think they're more, more nocturnal, but uh, domestic animals tend to assume the sleep, same sleep pattern as their owners. And why does your dog go to sleep at night? Well, because you go to sleep at night and hopefully he stays asleep and doesn't interfere with yours. So how's it going humans? Um, as anybody who's had children knows, little babies sleep a lot. And interestingly, they spend about half their time in REM when you saw the slide in adults, we're typically about 20% of them. And that's really important for brain development, uh, incorporation of new information, learning. Uh, the brain kind of rearranges and stores things when we're in REM sleep. Infants, a little less, and as time goes on, we get into toddlers and preschoolers. Still, they sleep quite a bit. And that's why those kids, you know, they'll put them down at seven at night and they'll get up at seven or eight in the morning. Uh, school age children, a little less. And then teenagers, this is really important here to recognize for anybody that has teenagers. So teenagers need between nine and a half, I'm sorry, eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep, um, upwards of 10 hours. And so it's important to recognize that your teenager is not being lazy by sleeping so much. It's actually what they need at that stage in life. Um, and they're not going to have the sleep, same sleep patterns that you have. So Teenagers tend to have more of a, what we call delayed sleep pattern. So they want to go to bed later and they want to sleep in later. And so typically your teenager wants to go to bed, you know, midnight one and then get up at, you know, nine or 10 in the morning. Uh, that doesn't work well with school schedules and can lead to some conflict, but it is part of the normal evolution of sleep. And then for adults between seven, and nine hours and people like, oh, well, if it's seven hours and I can get six and a half hours because that's almost seven. And really seven is the, the, the bottom number if you want to have the full restorative aspects of sleep. And some people need more and, and that's okay. And again, it's not a sign of laziness or un, you know, being unmotivated. It's just, it's just what the body needs. And of course, as anybody who gets older knows, it changes as you get older. Um, as we talked about, babies 
they sleep a lot in this graphic, more than half the time, and a huge chunk of REM. And then as we get older, more wake time, less REM. And as we get even older, very little REM. And this has a lot of ramifications. It is a normal process, but it also interferes with some of the cognitive aspects of, of our function. And, and maybe one of the reasons why, you know, as we get older, we just don't feel like we're as sharp as we used to be. And it could be, you know, potentially tied to age-related reduction in REM sleep. So why sleep important? I, I think the best way to look at it, or one way to look at it is what happens if you don't get enough sleep? And this graphic is just a partial list. There's much, much more, uh, and there's more research coming out all the time. So first off, just your memory, your function, your focus. Remember, REM sleep is super important for consolidating memories, organizing memories, storing things. It's almost like house cleaning your brain at night. If you don't have enough REM sleep, then your memory is not going to be that great. Heart, uh, we know that Chronic sleep deprivation leads to higher incidences of heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure. We also know that inadequate sleep weakens your immunity. If you're not sleeping enough, your body doesn't have the wherewithal and the resources to fight infections, and so you get sick more. Certainly mood issues, if you're not getting enough sleep, it's hard to be perky and happy. And if you're predisposed to depression, sleep deprivation can certainly push you in that direction makes you gain weight. Well, why would that happen? Because I'm spending less time asleep, less time laying there, not doing anything. I'm moving more, so I should lose weight. Well, your body sees it as a sign of fatigue. And so what the body does when it's fatigued, it wants to store more energy. So it'll release these brain hormones that actually make you crave high calorie food. And also because your body's fatigued, it slows the metabolism down. It's like, oh, I'm tired. I'm not going to burn as much energy. And so actually inadequate sleep is counterproductive if you're trying to lose weight. And of course, weight gain and diabetes are tied together, even damaging of skin. Because um, again, part of what happens during sleep is our body repairs itself. Stuff that got damaged during the day, it fixes during the night. And if there's not enough time to fix it, then you get more wrinkles. And who wants that? And then lastly, just because of a whole variety of issues that we kind of touched on here, life expectancy is shorter. Uh, we haven't quantified that, so I can't tell you if you get six and a half hours of sleep, you'll leave two years less. But we know from epidemiologic studies that people who sleep less tend to die sooner. And what's the most important part about getting sleep, getting good sleep, sleep hygiene. And this is a, it's a big topic. It's probably the most important part of this whole talk. You know, before we had Thomas Edison and his light bulb, we would get up when the sun came up and we'd do whatever we need to do during the day. And when the sun went down, we pretty much went to sleep. You can only sit and read by a candle for so long. And now, of course, we have 24-hour society and all these distractions in our lives that kind of interfere with our ability to sleep. So the best way to think about sleep hygiene is use a corollary of dental hygiene, right? So if you got, sorry about the gross picture, it's almost dinner. Um, if you've got bad dental hygiene, what do you get? You get bad teeth, right? And this is the fill in the blank. So guess what? Bad sleep hygiene means bad sleep. And you sleep like this guy or, or not sleep like this guy. And this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but how many people end their evening in bed, staring at their phone or being on their laptop or making lists or doing tasks or doing other things instead of sleeping? These are all activating things in your brain. And what your brain wants to do before bedtime, not even before you get into bed, to start relaxing, start winding down. And so this absolutely is not conducive to sleep, but I think everybody could look down and go, yeah, okay, I've done that maybe a few times or maybe every night. Um, you know, phones are a huge part of our lives now, but we survived for millennia before we had them. And it's okay to turn them off. It's okay to put them away. So this is probably the most important slide in the whole talk. Um, if you obey these principles, it would fix probably 80, 90% of the sleep disorders out there. Um, first off, ensure that you go to bed and get up around the same time. You know, it's a circadian rhythm. It's a clock. And we have bedtimes and wake times. And again, before technology and life hit us, uh, we had the sun. It went up, it went down, it made it pretty easy. So you really want to try to go to bed around the same time and get up around the same time, you know, with the half hour or so in, in the exceptions. And then be sure during that time, you're getting between seven and nine. And no, six and a half does not average up to seven. Seven is really the bare minimum. Probably eight is ideal for most people. 
Um, sleep is a very easy place to get extra time. Well, I got this to do and that to do. And so I'll just take it from sleep because there's spare time there. But again, if you want to function, you want to be healthy, really seven to nine hours and six and a half, eight, seven. Uh, stimulants and stimulating behavior. We kind of talked about that last slide with, you know, being on your phone, watching TV. Um, there's now this whole thing of blue light blocking glasses. So blue light is emanated by electronics and it can be a more stimulating type of light. Light stimulates wakefulness, but it's not the answer. It's not like, oh, I can just put my blue light glasses on and stare at my phone for an hour. And then stimulants, anything that's stimulating. It could be you know, a stimulating program. It could be a stimulating book. It could be um, you know, arguing with your spouse, whatever it is. So bedtime should be relaxation. Um, Dr. Bell, yes. a question. Sorry, I'm interrupting. Um, the one of the questions is: Is it true that we need to sleep more during the winter based on less daylight hours? Thanks for the question. That's a good question. It actually works in the opposite direction. We tend to sleep more because there's less light. You know, especially, you know, in our part of the world, you know, middle of summer, sun's not going down to 9 p.m. Light is a wake stimulus. And so the more light there is, the more wake we want to be. And in winter, we have darkness. You know, darkness hits, you know, five o'clock in, in the depths of winter. You may notice that in winter, you tend to eat dinner earlier than you do in the summertime, just because in the summer we're stimulated, we're doing things in winter, that, that darkness is already kind of stimulating our downtime. And, and typically we will want to sleep earlier or go to sleep earlier in, in the winter. So the, the bedtime routine, the relaxing routine, there's these old fashioned things. They're made out of paper. They're called books. Um, getting one of those with dim light, something that's not too engaging is a great way to wind down. Um, things like that, that you know, kind of hard to do in the busy world, but you really want to kind of wind down at least an hour before sleep and not just try to go from 100 miles an hour to jumping in bed and expecting to fall asleep immediately. What's wrong with me? Well, you've just been running your motor 100 miles an hour. You can't just put the brakes on and fall asleep that quick. Conducive sleep environment. It's got to be the right temperature. It's got to be comfortable. You've got to have the light shut out. You can't have your three dogs and your two cats in bed with you. Um, and you know, negotiating this with your spouse is often difficult. Different bedtimes, different um, temperature preferences. There's a whole variety of things out there, you know, different types of mattresses and split electric blankets, et cetera. But your environment has to be comfortable for you. Naps are not bad, but if you do take naps, it should be like 15, 20 minutes. Uh, if you're sleeping for more than an hour during the day, you're just kind of robbing your sleep drive from the night. And so daytime naps can interfere and it can become a vicious cycle. So the more you nap during the day, you're less sleepy during the night. So you're more sleepy during the day and this can perpetuate itself. Um, neither alcohol nor caffeine are good for sleep. Caffeine's pretty obvious. Um, alcohol has kind of an unearned reputation for, oh, I'll just have a nightcap. What alcohol does is it actually does promote light sleep. So you'll feel kind of drowsy and feel like you want to fall asleep, but it interferes with deep sleep. And you'll find if you do drink before bedtime, you have this kind of tossy, turny, restless sleep. Regular exercise, obviously not close to bedtime, you know, afternoon, early evening at the latest. We know exercise is outstanding for sleep. And I think if any of you have been out and put in a real big physical day, you sleep really well that night. Clock watching, again, we didn't have these 200 years ago. It's, it perpetuates, oh, it's three. Oh, now it's 3.15. Oh God, now it's 3.30. And it just perpetuates that whole not sleeping thing. And so it's okay to turn the clock around. You don't have to look at it. And then again, we talked about the electronic tasks. So again, this is the most important slide in the whole talk. You know, if you hear this and you really do your best to make all these things happen, sleep will usually happen for you. I have another question. Uh, is the, the power nap for 15 minutes, for example, actually not beneficial? Some people get benefit out of it. And, you know, people say, oh, well, naps are bad. But naps aren't bad as long as you're sleeping well at night. You know, if you are napping during the day to compensate for bad sleep at night, that's counterproductive. Conversely, if, yeah, I sleep pretty well at night, but I kind of bonk in the afternoon and a 15, 20 minute nap makes me feel good. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we didn't talk about circadian rhythms, but we all have this kind of natural dip in our circadian rhythm in the afternoon. And typically it happens between two and three in the afternoon. People forever have blamed, oh, it's because I had lunch. What had nothing to do with lunch, it's just a normal rhythm. 
you know, over in Europe, they have this thing called the siesta. They take in the afternoon, they close all the shops around three o'clock and they go home, they take a nap, they come back and open up again. So it is part of our circadian rhythm. Um, and again, if, as long as you're sleeping well at night, naps are totally fine. Um, beds only for two things, even though there's a lot of other things you can be doing there. It's for that and it's for that and you can figure out the rest. So like I mentioned, two of the most common things that we address in the sleep clinic are insomnia. And insomnia is really not one thing. Uh, it's different things to different people. Um, it can be somebody who has trouble falling asleep. Gosh, I fall asleep great. And then, or so, somebody who falls asleep easy rather. And I'm screwing this up. Somebody who has difficulty falling asleep, but once they get asleep, they sleep through the night, they feel great. Or somebody who falls asleep well, and then wakes up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. And then somebody who's like, eh, it's just never good. I'm tossy, turny. I just don't really feel over, like I ever sleep well. And all of these are insomnia and they can have a whole variety of causes and a whole variety of solutions based on what's going on. But we really consider it clinically significant when it distresses the person or impairs their daytime function. If somebody says, yeah, I never really sleep that well, but I feel great during the day and it doesn't really bother me. It's like, yeah, okay. But again, when it gets in the way of what you need to do and it's distressing, that's really when it gets our attention. And part of it is that we're all a little bit different, right? Um, you look at two pictures here. On the right, we have Will Farrell, who's trying to make a free throw underhand. And then, of course, we have Steph Curry on the left, and he's making a slam dunk from the top of the key. And even though Steph has you know, really refined his craft and worked hard at what he has, he had some innate ability whereas Will Farrell apparently doesn't have any innate ability in basketball. And the reason I show this, it's important to understand that we all have different things that we're good at. And some people are naturally just great sleepers and typically insomniacs hate them. And then some people are naturally not great sleepers. And so you have to kind of understand who you are and work from there. Um, there are some people that can just lay down on a pile of gravel and take a nap and other people say, you know, I haven't, I haven't slept well my whole life. And so that's a good starting point. And when I'm getting a history, I always say, hey, when did this problem start? Is it something brand new? Or have you been like this your whole life? Do you have trouble sleeping when you're in college? Oh, yeah, I couldn't sleep at all in college. That tells me it's kind of a lifelong problem. You're kind of on the Will Ferrell end of the spectrum. Is it common? Yeah, it's really common. So 30 to 40 percent of people will complain about difficulty sleeping. And going back to that impairment and distress, it's a quarter to half of those. And interestingly, for probably a variety of reasons, it, it's much more common in women. So about one and a half times more common in women than in men. And there's a lot of theories on that. The next slide illustrates one of the theories. I didn't make that up. I, I got that from somewhere. So what, what happens with insomnia? Well, it's pretty obvious. You're fatigued, you're sluggish, you're sleepy. You don't feel good, somatic complaints. Things just don't feel right. I'm achy, I just, I feel awful. People stress about it. It creates mood disturbances. We get grumpy. You know, the filters go away when we're sleep deprived, right? So the first thing to go is your patience. When you're tired, that's that's the first thing that goes. You'll find yourself, you know, snapping at people and just not, you know, working through problems as well as you normally would. Poor focus and concentration, again, obvious. And of course, then it also manifests with poor performance, not even at your work, just in, in everyday life, just things you have to do and interacting with your friends and your family. So it's it really can be a, a dramatic effect, adverse effect on people's lifestyle. But what's interesting, see, you know, we talked about how prevalent this problem is. This is a study that was done a number of years ago with chronic insomniacs. So up to 70% of the people never even brought it up with their physicians. Or about a quarter of them went in and said, well, I went in for this and that. And by the way, I'm going to mention my insomnia. And it was only 5% or 120 people that actually brought it up to their physician. Hey, you know, I'm going to come in and just talk about my sleep. So I like to call this the, the doorknob question. So you see a patient for whatever other reasons, you kind of get through all that. The doctor's got their hand on the doorknob about to walk out the door. The patient says, oh, by the way, I'm having trouble sleeping. Um, that doesn't work. You know, if, if the physician's busy, they might just give you a quick prescription for a sleeping pill, which is definitely the wrong way to approach it. So it really is um, something that takes a dedicated visit. And why? Well, because it's complicated. Um, there's a lot of things that go into insomnia. So up here at the top, we can have acute stressors. So this is you know, stress-related insomnia. Usually these are transient events, something bad happened physically, emotionally, life, whatever. 
Um, medication and substances can do it. Um, substances are kind of everywhere now. A whole slew of medications can interfere with sleep. Circadian factors. Um, so, you know, we're a 24 hour world now. We're still designed to sleep when it's dark and be awake when it's light. Well, we have swing shift and we have night shift. And so these poor people are working when they're supposed to be asleep and trying to sleep when they're awake. That's a very difficult problem to fix. Medical issues, neurologic factors can contribute to sleep in a big, big way or adversely contribute to it. Psychiatric disorders, um, sleep disturbances are almost the rule with untreated psychiatric disorders and you have to kind of recognize those. Behavioral factors, we kind of talked about sleep hygiene. There's a whole variety of things that we can address there that again, don't involve medicines. Um, age, we touched on that as well. It doesn't get any easier as you get older, sleep and a whole lot of other things. And then primary sleep pathology. So specifically here, we're talking about things like restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea. I have a, another question that's come in. Um, sure. You mentioned about nightcaps being bad, especially before bed. How, when, how do you feel about alcohol at dinner? Is that okay? Well, I, I, I guess it depends on when you eat dinner, right? So if you eat dinner at 10 and go to bed at 11, not so much. So, um, you know, the, the mantra is that, you know, men process about one alcoholic beverage per hour and women um, about half that. So you just got to have enough time. So if you have a glass of wine with dinner, just be sure it's at least two hours before bedtime. And again, the male female thing, I don't know that that really holds a lot of water. And I, I think for everybody, you know, one drink, have at least two hours before bedtime, two drinks, at least four hours before bedtime. And again, nothing right before bed, because that's just not going to, not going to go well. There's another question you might get to, but um, asking about getting back to sleep when you wake up, are there techniques you recommend to helping someone get back to sleep quickly? Um, this particular person meditates every day, um, has been told that meditating is not an effective tool in getting back to sleep. Do you have a point of view on this? Yeah, there's there, there's no quick answer. I'd love to have some magic and say, oh, just do this. It'll work great. Um, I, I think part of it depends on what's waking you up in the middle of the night. You know, is it you're waking up and then think about all the tasks you have to do the next day or you wake up in the middle of the night because you have to urinate or you're waking up in the middle of the night because you're having hot flashes because you're menopausal. And so I, I think there's not a quick answer to it. If it's just a, you know, gosh, I wake up for no reason. I can't fall back asleep. You know, the old mantra used to be in sleep hygiene, and I took it out of the slide, was, okay, I'm awake in the middle of the night, and it's been 15 minutes, I'm still not falling asleep, and I'm going to get out of bed and go do something until I feel tired again and go back to sleep. And that can work for some people, but the problem is sometimes we get caught up in interesting things, or we get started on projects, and we have that sense that I've got to complete it. Um, I mean, the best thing, again, is, is just relaxation, and most importantly, not trying to stress about it. And I'm going to touch on that in a few slides here, you start developing that stress of, oh, it's 3.15 and now it's 3.30. Oh my God, I have to get up in three hours. What am I going to do? You know, that that's going to perpetuate the problem. So meditation itself, I mean, on the face of it, it sounds like a good idea because meditation is all about self-relaxation and inner focus and, and not being distracted. And, and, you know, the bottom line is if, if that's what works, that'd be great. Um, but again, a lot of it has to do with what is waking you up and what's keeping you awake and, and the causes there are myriad. There's sure. a, there's a follow-up too about, you know, is a boring audio book, a good way to get back to sleep. I'm sorry, is it what? A boring audio book. Yeah. Again, you, you got to figure out what works for you. You know, if there, if there was one thing that worked for everybody would have one thing. And I think really, you know, again, you avoid stimulation and if you can get on a boring audio book and then you fall asleep and wake up two hours later with the headphones on. Yeah, that that's great. Um, th there's not one answer. And I think it is a little bit of trial and error. So this slide's interesting. So this is um, looking at metabolic rates and chronic insomniacs. And so these are the folks that I touched on briefly before that have never slept well, even when they're teenagers and and in college when we have the best sleep of our lives and they never slept well. And this is just looking at the metabolic rate compared to normals. And so this upper line here is the chronic insomniacs and the lower line here is quote unquote normals. And the interesting part of the slide is chronic insomniacs tend to be a little bit more wired if you will. Um, there hasn't been a lot of follow-up on this. It'd be interesting to see if down the road we can maybe address this from the me mechanistic standpoint. But it's just kind of interesting. It just tells you that people who don't sleep well, it's not all in their heads. There's more going on there. So how's insomnia world? So 
baseline, here we live, um, this is the, the insomnia line. So we live below this line, we're sleeping well, above this line, we're having trouble. So we live down here, maybe we're predisposed to insomnia, then something happens in our lives, some stressful things, and they're not sleeping. Usually that will resolve itself, we'll find some resolution, and we kind of get back below the insomnia threshold. But there's some folks who perpetuate, they just stay there and they don't ever really get back below the insomnia threshold. And there's a whole variety of factors that can cause that. Oops, I went the, other, the wrong way. But the, the most important part of this, and this is the other, probably second most important slide in this talk, this is called psychophysiologic insomnia. We, we Doctors, we put a big name on it so it makes us feel smart. Psychophysiologic insomnia, wow. But really what that is, it's just a perpetuating factor. So something happens where you have difficulty falling and maintaining sleep. And then you lay there and it's like, God, I didn't sleep last night, so I'm probably not going to sleep tonight. And here I am not sleeping again. So then you get frustrated and you start anticipating not sleeping instead of trying to sleep. And then that, of course, makes us more agitated. And then we do other things that may be maladaptive, trying to fall back asleep, like, oh, I'll turn on the TV or I'll get on Facebook or I'll get some work done since I'm not sleeping anyway. And so it can become this vicious cycle. And it's really, really important to recognize when you're in this because it'll self-perpetuate. And I've seen patients, they've been doing this for years. Like, oh yeah, this started with my divorce five years ago and it's been going on, ongoing ever since. And so it's really important to recognize this and try to break the cycle. So how do we manage these patients? Um, so first thing again, go through that very extensive history. We talked about all the different factors that can contribute to insomnia, medical issues, substance issues, psychological issues, et cetera, et cetera. The first thing we always start with is education, educating about you know, that vicious cycle of psychophysiologic insomnia, better health habits, you know, avoiding the nighttime uh, alcohol, getting adequate exercise, sleep hygiene. And even with all that, there are people who are still not sleeping. And so then we get down to non-pharmacologic therapy, and there's a, there's a variety of approaches to that. And then pharmacologic therapy, yes, meds do have a place. They have a very, very bad reputation. The medications do have a place. Most of this is usually managed by a good primary care doctor. When none of this is working, then they go see a sleep specialist. And the first thing we do, how long has this been going on? What caused it? Do you have something else going on that's causing it? Restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea. Most people don't even recognize what restless leg syndrome is, so they don't even talk about it. Daytime symptoms, are you tired, are you not tired? Do you have mood issues? What are your sleep habits? And a lot of times I'll have patients fill out a two week sleep log of when they went to bed and when they went up and how many times they got up in the middle of the night. Cause that can be very, very telling. You'll see certain patterns like, gosh, you know, I'm sleeping five hours during the week and 12 hours on the weekend. Why don't I feel good? So you can glean a lot of information from the previous sleep log. And you can do this for yourself too, because sometimes you just won't recognize the pattern unless you write it down. It's like, if you write down what you have for dinner every night and you do that for a couple of weeks, it's like, oh, I didn't realize we had pizza every Thursday. So you can sometimes see patterns that are, are kind of a, a starting point for interventions. Of course, the medical, neurologic, psychiatric history, medications, as we talked about, many medications can adversely affect sleep. And healthy living is good for everything, including sleep. But again, like we talked about earlier, it's, it's really complicated. And that's why it can't be the doorknob question for your doctor. How do we treat it? We kind of talked about that, the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic effects or approaches rather. So the first step for anybody is, is counting sheep. And if you're a quick counter, there's actually 29 sheep in this, in this slide. So the non-pharmacologic, and again, this is a little bit beyond uh, the time we have for this talk. But you know, again, sleep hygiene is always number one. Stimulus control, getting things out of the the room that don't, you know, that don't that shouldn't be there that distract you from sleep. Sleep restriction. There's people that were only sleeping six hours a night, but they're in bed nine hours, so they can get six hours. So really, what you do there is like, if we're only sleeping six hours a night, that's all I get in bed. And then as you get more and more tired and spend more time in bed, you can expand that time. Relaxation training, there's a whole bunch of different uh, modalities here. There's meditation that was mentioned. Um, I've had a lot of success sending my patients to biofeedback. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, there are apps for this now. Uh, it used to be you'd have to go see a trained psychologist, it was expensive, and now you can buy an app uh, for cognitive behavioral therapy. And that actually works for a lot of people. And really what that's about is to kind of take that stress out of 
sleep, you know, that whole, oh my God, I'm not sleeping, so I'm not going to sleep. And it kind of helps break that cycle. And then circadian rhythm entrainment, this is a, a much bigger subject, but essentially for people whose uh, sleep patterns are out of sync with what they need to be doing, like the teenager who wants to go to bed at one in the morning and can't get up till 10, that this person has a job that starts at eight o'clock in the morning. And that's a much more complicated approach, but I just mentioned it for completeness sake. So when do we use meds? Again, meds are appropriate for insomnia when used. You gotta use the right tool for the right job and you can't just give everybody who has insomnia a sleeping pill because they have downsides. Um, we, we know that long-term use of sleeping pills can lead to long-term cognitive impair impairment, uh, even potentially predispose you to Alzheimer's and dementia, which is something nobody wants. And there's definitely a correlation there with long-term use. So certainly acute stress, like something horrible is happening in somebody's life. Yeah, sure. Use something for you know, a week or two just to kind of get over that hump. Uh, chronic insomniacs, again, these patients that have never slept well their entire lives through multiple life stages. I have some patients that are on sleep medicines pretty much forever because it's either that or not sleep and have all those adverse consequences or predictable stress. Like, oh my God, I got to be at you know, whatever tomorrow and I have to sleep tonight. It's okay to take something. And then lastly, you know, people who are on shift work, like you can't come home from a graveyard shift at seven o'clock in the morning, the sun's up in the sky and go to bed and sleep for eight hours. And so it's appropriate to use for those people. Suboptimal, but again, there are some people that just have to work night shifts and we're, we're all indebted to them actually. This is a great slide. This is from a number of years ago. Um, this was a sleep medicine that was advertised on TV. And the reason I put normal sleep up there is they wanted you to think that this was normal sleep. So there you are laying down, you got little butterflies throwing fairy dust on you, makeup is perfect, little Mona Lisa smile, and here you are, and this is sleep. And so the, the intention I think was, well, if you're not sleeping like this, there's something wrong with you and you need our med. Well, the truth is this is not normal sleep. We all get restless, we toss, we turn. We'll wake up numerous times during the night. We're probably not even aware of it, but everybody wakes up numerous times during the night. Sleep is just not that easy unless you're 20 years old. And it does get more difficult with age. But you have to kind of accept some of those changes and nurture you know, the, the good stuff that you do have and make it work for you. Because again, this is not what sleep is supposed to be unless you're trying to sell a drug. Well, speaking of drugs, there's a bunch of them. Um, top line here, some of these names might be familiar to you. These are older drugs. They have a lot of downsides. These are cleaner medicines, the GABA receptor agonist, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata. They're much more specific to kind of metaphorically uh, flip the, sweet, the sleep switch, to turn the sleep switch on. Uh, most over-the-counter medicines are some version of antihistamines. Interestingly, histamine is an activating neurochemical in our brains. It's a wake medicine. So think about it, we go antihistamines, we counteract the weight chemical that makes us sleepy. So virtually everything that's over the counter is some version of this. There's a whole variety of antidepressants that are used off-label for treatment of insomnia. They do have roles and some of them are effective. Melatonin. I always get questions about melatonin, so I'll answer the questions now because everyone's like, oh, melatonin. Um, is it natural? Yes. Um, is it part of our sleep cycles? Yes. Is it a good sleep medicine? No, with one exception. So melatonin actually helps with the circadian rhythm. So melatonin is secreted uh, from a little gland in our brain when it's time to go to sleep. And so it entrains our circadian rhythm, entrains our sleep-wake cycle. So where it's useful is for jet lag. So let's say you're flying to Italy and it's you know nine or 10 hours later, what you do is you take three milligrams of melatonin around seven o'clock local time, you do that for three nights and it helps entrain your sleep stages to local time and it cuts off about an hour per day. It is not a sleep medicine. It does not put you to sleep. And it's actually being, um, it's less in favor now just because melatonin is tied to a whole variety of other um, endocrine systems in our body. So you know, this doesn't live alone in our brain, everything interacts. And so the concern is if we start affecting the sleep-wake cycle with melatonin, we're going to have other adverse hormonal effects in our body that may be, may be counter, counterproductive. Seroquel is an ultra-antipsychotic, uh, should not be used for sleep, but some people use it when they're desperate. Velsarma, this is a newer drug, very interesting. So again, every single medicine we have above on the list turns on the sleep switch. 
Belsamra actually turns off the wake switch. And we would think, man, that got to work great. And in my experience, I've used it probably 15 times. I've yet to have somebody come in and say, man, that was awesome. But we'll keep trying. Hormonal therapy, again, for uh, menopausal women that's interfering with their sleep, low doses of estrogen. Uh, when I go this route, I certainly um, I collaborate with their, their gynecologist to be sure that's appropriate and we have them on the lowest dose. And again, home remedies, nightcap, you guys are all experts now. You know that alcohol is not going to work for you. There's a couple more questions relating to that topic. Um, one is asking about um, CBDs, especially CBD that's marketed as um, something that's helpful for sleeping. Yep. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, it's getting a lot of um, attention nowadays because you know it's legal in California, it's legal in Nevada, um, and, and you know it kind of ties into the whole THC thing as well. So CBD has actually very little effects on sleep that have been well documented in research. Um, that being said, the research is kind of hard to do because there's different strains, different doses, and there hasn't any, really ever been a real good, well-controlled, well-done research study to look at it. The lesser quality science shows that it doesn't seem to help that much. People say, oh man, I took my friend's CBD and I slept super great. Okay, but six months later, was it working? And so there's probably some placebo effect. THC, interestingly, does seem to help with sleep. Uh, it helps, seems to help with sleep onset. It seems to help with sleep duration. And it seems to help with restorative aspects of sleep to a degree. It's not a panacea. And the other interesting thing that I just read um, probably a couple of weeks ago was there seems to be an age cutoff. So if you're younger than 65, it does seem to help to a small degree. If you're older than 65, it seems to have actually negative effects. Um, and again, I think the hard part is that, you know, anybody can make an unsubstantiated claim to sell something. Um, there's not a lot of great science to support it. Um, but again, if you want to try CBD and it's helpful, the stuff's pretty expensive. I don't know if you, you've looked at what it costs. It's, it's fairly expensive. And some of my patients swear by it. I'm like, hey, you know, if you get it from a reputable source and it's helping you sleep, great. Again, there's no good science to support that just yet, maybe down the road. Relating to the melatonin um, portion, um, the question asked, do you, do you get less melatonin as you get older, 65 or older? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we get less of everything when we're 65 and older except aches and pains, right? Um, so yeah, and that's probably part of, you know, that slide we looked at earlier with, you know, the kind of decrement in sleep quality, sleep duration, amount of REM, et cetera. The flip side is that replacing it or taking more melatonin doesn't necessarily fix the problem. And so it's probably a multifactorial issue, not just less melatonin leads to less sleep. If that was the case, we'll all take melatonin and sleep great till we die, right? And then there was a question about um, L-theanine. Um, is that a supplement that's good for sleep? Yeah, I'm honestly not familiar with that one. Um, again, you know, if you go into you know the herbal section of the store, there's all these different permutations and combinations. You know, very few herbal remedies have one thing in them. You look at the at the ingredient list, and there can be 10, 20, 30 things in there. And honestly, really nobody has any idea how well those interact because it's just hard to do that science. Um, I'm not aware of any specific supplement uh, or vitamin that actually, you know, is, is documented to really improve sleep. That being said, if you take it and it helps you, yeah, why not? So anyway, now that we've asked, answered those questions, you probably had a chance to kind of review this slide. This is just kind of everything we talked about, um, you know, ruling out primary sleep disorders, treat primary medical problems, sleep hygiene with at least three exclamation points, and those things below there um, that, uh, that can also help. So I'm gonna to touch really quickly on, on sleep apnea. This is the other very common thing we see in the sleep clinic. Um, th this is a classic slide. Unlike insomnia, it tends to be more common in women than men. Sleep apnea tends to be about two times more common in men than women, mostly just because of anatomic issues and the way that the differences in the way our, our, our throats are constructed. It's very common, it's very dangerous, it's very recognizable, easily recognizable, and it's very treatable. Um, the symptoms are pretty straightforward. So these folks typically snore very loudly. And just because your bed partner sleeps or snores loudly rather, doesn't mean they have sleep apnea. 
Um, most people who snore do not have sleep apnea. Virtually everybody who has obstructive sleep apnea snores. So what the bed partner will often observe is like, oh, he or she just quits breathing and they will count 20, 30, 40 seconds. Ends with a big gasp and this can happen over and over all night. And typically the patient, the person that have this is unaware of it because they're trying to sleep through all this. Typically they're very tired during the day because their sleep is being fragmented all night. Uh, morning headaches and dry mouth are very common. They're grumpy just because they're not sleeping well, can interfere with uh, memory and, and even lead to accidents. I've had uh, two patients literally walk into my office bandaged up from car accidents because, oh, you know, my wife's been telling me for years I do this and I think it's time to get it looked at. So it is a very serious thing to look at. Um, they did a study in Michigan. This was, gosh, 10 years ago. And, um, and again, maybe it was that part of the country where there tend to be a lot of kind of bigger people that upwards of 40% of long haul truck drivers had clinically significant sleep apnea. If that's not enough to scare you off the road, you got a guy driving a 40 ton vehicle and he's tired. It's really scary. Now, the um, most states have sleep apnea screening as a requirement uh, for getting your commercial driver's license renewed. So we are making some progress there. Affects more than 22 million Americans, probably a lot more than that. And again, there's a whole bunch of people that are undiagnosed in the, the very astute audience members will say, well, how can you know 80% of them are undiagnosed if they're not diagnosed? And it's an estimate. They, they, they do uh, population studies on that. So how does it work? So our normal airway is over here. This is our tongue. We're laying flat at night. Airway is open. So it goes in through our nose, our mouth, goes down in the airway. Great. Here, the tongue drops back. It smushes on the soft palate and obstructs the airway. So here, this is rattling around. That's the snoring. This is the apneic event. And right here, the brain is stuck with a really tough decision. Man, I really want to sleep, but I really need to breathe. And, and thankfully, breathing almost always wins. So you'll get a little shot of adrenaline. Uh, muscle tone will return. The tongue will prop up. Breathing restores itself. And this can happen over and over and over all night. This can happen 20, 30, 40, 80 times. I've seen over 100 times per hour. And I look at a sleep study sometimes. I'm like, how do you survive the night? It's just crazy. And what's it lead to? Well, it's a long list, but this is all real stuff. Impotence, so we can get the guy's attention here. High blood pressure, obesity. We talked about how sleep deprivation leads to that. Sleepiness, fatigue, diabetes, car crashes, not doing well at your job. Heart problems. This is a biggie. So high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes are two times more common in people with untreated sleep apnea than those who don't. Headaches, strokes we talked about, uh, adverse effects on the heart memory loss, and of course, dementia is more common because we're not getting adequate sleep. How do we diagnose it? In the old days, everyone went to this great place called the sleep lab. And so it looks really super nice and comfortable. You'd hook up to a whole bunch of wires and things and uh, the technologist is in the other room. And this is still the right test for certain types of patients. And I won't go into that right now. Um, but the vast majority of patients now we're testing with home sleep monitors because the technology is really, really good. And for the most part, we get most of the information from this device that we get from an in-lab sleep study. So it's a little thing that goes on your forehead here, and there's a little cannula that goes in your nose to measure airflow. And we can get most of what we need for the vast majority of patients with this. And once we find it, how do we treat it? Well, CPAP uh, is, is really the gold standard. It does work well. So again, here's our collapsed airway. There's no air going through. So the device generates air pressure. That air pressure acts as an air pillar or a pneumatic splint, and it keeps the airway open. And it works extraordinarily well. Um, and, and the equipment's come a long way. So in the old days, this was kind of the vision of sleep apnea, this big, horrible, uncomfortable mask, this loud machine. Um, sleep apnea guy looks like Bane. Um, I think Bane's better looking, but I'll leave that to you to decide. The current devices are much better. So this is the current mask. Um, there's a whole variety of them. They've been redesigned. So the tube attaches at the top of the head. The machines are much smaller. They're quieter. And interestingly, they're now all automatic. So in the old days, you have to go to a sleep lab. So the technologist, while you're asleep, could find out the right pressure when you're asleep, when you're in REM, when you're on your back. Now the machine figures it out. As soon as it senses your airway's closing off, it just raises the pressure enough. It senses your airway opens and then it backs off and it does that all night. And, and I've seen just amazing results with these things. I had a patient last week breathing 157 times per hour while asleep. 
the machine keeps track of how well it works. We put them on one of these, it's down to 0.6. I'm just like, we couldn't have done that in the sleep lab. So the technology has really come a long way. It does work well, but it's not for everybody. And so we have oral appliances for people that have milder degree of sleep apnea. There's a whole variety of designs out there. This is just one of them for an example. But the way they work is they use the upper teeth as kind of a lever to pull the chin forward because the chin, the tongue's attached to the chin. So as the chin goes forward, the tongue goes forward and that opens up the space. And that can work really, really well for the right patient. And we have some really good resources to get those built. So that's the happy ending. See, nice little small CPAP machine. Everybody's sleeping, they're happy. So with that, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I added one slide because this, this is a new thing. I mean, I, was used, I used to be done right there, but this is the, the latest thing for sleep apnea. Um, so you've probably seen ads on TV. Their, their advertising kind of bugs me because I think it's misleading because it is misleading. Um, but it is a really good technology. It really is good for some people. And so the ad, one of the ones I saw was this lady, she took all her sleep apnea equipment, she shoved it in a drawer, and then she gets in bed, she taps this little thing on her chest, and she goes to sleep. Hey, sign me up for that, right? That sounds great. Why would I deal with a sleep apnea machine or a dental appliance and just tap this thing on my chest? What she's doing, it was remote to turn this little guy on here. And what it does is it senses when you're taking a breath with this lead, and then it sends an impulse through this lead to a... Um, a nerve that controls your tongue. It's called the hypoglossal nerve. So every time you're trying to take a breath at night, it sends an impulse to the tongue and moves the tongue forward. And it actually works. It's a big deal to get done. It's very complicated, it involves surgery. Um, it's numerous uh, visits to our office to get it properly adjusted. But this actually is a really good device. It does work well. And for certain people, it is the right thing to do. But it's just not for everybody. And then here's uh, my second to last slide. So this is John Wesley Harden, who was a notorious gunfighter in the Old West. Interestingly, he was thrown in uh, prison for murder. He eventually got out and became a very successful lawyer. Um, but his quote was, they tell lots of lies about me. They say I killed six or seven men for snoring. Well, it ain't true. I only killed one man for snoring. Wasn't as bad of a guy as we thought. So with that, we'll take any other questions. And hopefully this isn't all of you right now. Maybe it is. I, I don't think so. I think this has been very informative. Thank you. Um, we have gotten more questions. So I'm going to keep going and keep sending them in as, as you think of them. But there were a couple more about, I think, more of the supplements. One was, um, can over-the-counter magnesium help with relaxation and sleep? Yeah, so magnesium is a you know magnesium is a super important electrolyte in our bodies, and it's it's a cofactor in a lot of things that that help us physiologically function. Um, and so indirectly, so if you're magnesium deficient, it has and you can look it up, it has all sorts of adverse down downstream effects. And so if your physiology is not working well because you're magnesium deficient, you're not going to sleep well. If you have normal magnesium levels, you take magnesium, it's probably not going to do much. And if you take too much, well, you're going to spend some time in the john. Um, and there's a couple of questions about kind of um, aging. One was um, if you should start or start using supplements as you get older, as you age, and if so, what's your recommendation? And I'll ask the other one after you answer that. Yeah, that that's a little bit outside my my realm. You know, the the, the old days, like you had to have your well, in the old days they called it geritol. Like the, you got old, so you took geritol every day, so you're healthy and of course, they later changed the name of that because who would want to take something called Geritol? Um, and so now, you know, multivitamins are, are pushed heavily, especially for older folks. The reality is if you have a normal, healthy diet, which, by the way, promotes sleep, probably one of the best diets out there, it's not going diets, meeting plans, the Mediterranean diet, that vitamins really don't do much for you because you're getting everything you need from what you eat. And that's really the goal. Um, there's, a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole slew of supplements out there with all sorts of claims most of these have not been scientifically studied or validated. And so you're really kind of accepting somebody's claim about their, their supplement. So I don't have a lot of background on all the different supplements, uh, natural paths, or that's kind of where they live and probably be a better question for a natural path. Okay. The next set of questions are somewhat related. This one um, is a person who's over 65, getting a decent amount of sleep, um, two plus hours of REM, but the deep sleep is only 15 to 30 minutes at a time or at maximum every night. Is that normal? Do you have any suggestions? 
if not? Yes, because uh, you know the, the amount of wearable health technology out there is 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 growing exponentially, and so it sounds like somebody has a has a Fitbit or something similar. Um, yeah, I mean those devices are pretty good. Um, they're not directly measuring sleep stages; they're extrapolating based on a whole variety of other things that can actually measure from being on your wrist. So it's not really looking at brainwave activity, which is really the gold standard to identify sleep stages. Um, you know, the more important question that I would bounce back to that person is, well, how do you feel when you wake up? Oh yeah, I feel good. I'm doing pretty good during the day. Then it's really not a concern. Um, REM, as we saw in that one slide, does go down as a function of age, you know, upwards of 50% if you're an infant and, you know, 10 to 15 percent as you get older and those are normal age-related uh, changes and unfortunately there's really not a whole lot of way that we found so far to fix that so hopefully that answered the question i get i get wearable technology questions all the time yes and this next question is um is dreaming while sleeping still giving you the sleep rest hours that you need for adequate sleep yeah, so, you know, dreaming is really interesting, um, you know, and some people make whole careers of analyzing dream content relating to life or what you should be doing or not doing or what's going to happen to you in the future. Um, dreams are really probably not that predictive of anything. Uh, you know, as we talked about early in the, in the presentation, that REM sleep is where we have those really dramatic, memorable dreams. And so I guess it's a good sign if you're having vivid dreams because it tells you you are getting REM. Um, you know, dreaming, some people don't remember them at all. So, and we know, you know, put somebody in the sleep lab, they're having tons of REM and wake them up and say, hey, what'd you dream? So like, I didn't dream at all. Well, they were having REM, so they probably were. We don't know why some people remember their dreams and some people don't. Uh, myself, I remember my dreams every single night. My wife, she never remembers them, but I know she's having them. So it really, you know, the, 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 I guess, remembering dreams themselves really doesn't have a big influence on the quality of sleep or, or not remembering is, is an adverse sign of bad sleep. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, the next question is asking if you can explain restless leg syndrome. Sure. That's yeah. It, it's, it's fairly common. It comes in degrees um, and, and it, it's kind of hard to describe. And I think that's why a lot of patients don't bring it up to their doctor, but typically when they do, it's, it's a very difficult to describe sensation in their legs where it's described as crawly or, or creepy. And the only way that they can make that symptom go away is to move their legs. And as soon as they move their legs, the symptom goes away. And then as soon as they stop, it comes back. And you can imagine if you're trying to fall asleep and you're having to constantly move your legs to make this uncomfortable sensation go away, it's gonna keep you from sleeping. And again, a lot of people don't bring it up because they don't even know how to describe it or they think they're crazy or they, you know, somebody told them, well, that's normal. I kick my legs at night as well. Um, but it can interfere with sleep. And it's, it's actually very easy to treat. There's a number of medicines that work quite well. Um, it can also be associated with iron deficiency. So the one thing we always check when we see somebody with restless legs is an iron panel. And if they're iron deficient, we replace the iron and, and typically it'll go away. Um, so yeah, it's a really important thing to have to bring up to your doctor if you think you have that because it's very easily treated. And we just got a question in and all it says, so I apologize if the context isn't there, but central sleep apnea. Sure. So yeah, what, what I presented to you was mostly obstructive sleep apnea, which is far and away the most common type. There are two types of sleep apnea. So obstructive is where your airway closes off. So your body can't get a breath. Even the body's trying to breathe, the airway's closed. And so there's no air going in. Central sleep apnea is probably 10 to 20% of patients with sleep apnea. And it's a whole different uh, disorder in that instead of the airway being closed, the airway can be open or closed. The brain's just not sending a signal to the body to take a breath. And the same consequences occur where the brain's not sending a signal to take a breath. And eventually, because your oxygen levels drop and your body realizes it's suffocating, you get this little shot of adrenaline and wake up. Um, it's less common. We typically see it in association with other things like people who've had strokes or people who have congestive heart failure. Uh, and, and honestly, people who are on narcotic medications to take them at night because narcotics uh, impair respiratory drive. Uh, the treatments are similar, but a little different. You know, so dental appliances uh, don't work. Inspire devices don't work. But uh, you know, CPAP and other modalities can work for that. Well, that was excellent. I think that's all the questions that have come in. I did receive a separate question um, about whether this 
lecture could be passed along to a friend. It is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel. I'm happy to send out the link if you would like it. Um, it should be up and running by tomorrow. Um, and then just also a friendly reminder that you'll receive a survey uh, once this webinar has concluded. We love your feedback, love to, to hear how we did tonight and what future topics you'd like to hear from us. Um, but with that, I'm just going to say thank you so much, Dr. Trudell, for the excellent presentation. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. Yeah, th thanks for joining. I uh, enjoyed the talk. So uh, I, I kind of missed the interaction of live talks, but uh, hopefully it was informative and you laughed at my jokes. I don't know, but hopefully you did. <laughs> I, we appreciate the fact that you let us uh, ask questions mid mid presentation. So appreciate it. And you're getting lots of thank yous and great information in the chat box. So appreciate it again. Have a good night. Thanks again. All right. Bye, you guys.